Welcome to the IDF Podcast. This podcast is a service of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of those living with primary immunodeficiency. On this episode of the IDF Podcast, Karen Rohr, IDF's Communications Manager for Population Health, and myself, Zach Moore, IDF's Communications Manager for Digital Media, are joined by popular Twitch and YouTube personality Dog VA, or Connor. Connor won a streamer award last year for Best Philanthropic Event, wherein he streamed himself cycling across Japan in an effort to raise money for IDF. During his second cyclothon in March, Connor was able to raise more than $500,000 for IDF. On June 29th, Connor will once again be using his platform to help our mission, this time hosting an in-person auction in Los Angeles with the help of some friends. We took this opportunity to speak with Connor about his background, his career, and what led him to explore philanthropy in the world of content creation. Let's get started. Yeah, I, I grew up in Wales, which is a small country within the United Kingdom. Um, I grew up in kind of a, a pretty uh, small town <laughs> that's, that doesn't have much to do. Um, but I was always obsessed with video games. So that was kind of uh, my escape from that. But uh, yeah, I basically grew up around nature a bunch and I was always doing activities and always doing sports. Um, and to my parents' dismay, I was always playing video games as well. I can understand that because I have a child that plays video games. I think entirely too much, but that's okay. I, I, I told them it was an investment. I said, listen, <laughs> let me play video games. I'll, I'll figure something out. <laughs> that's fabulous. They were very patient. Um, so tell me, speaking of video games, tell me, when did you start playing? What did you start playing? Yeah, like, what I'm... were some of the early games that you played? Were they online games or just sort of? Uh, well, I when, I, when I grew up, it was kind of, um, at least in the UK, it was kind of a lot of like hand-me-downs from whoever had a game console. So I was, even though I was born in 1996, which is kind of, I mean, I guess it depends who you ask is, is old or young. Um, uh, I, I still actually played a lot of game consoles that came out uh, way before. So I was playing like Super Nintendo. Um, I played the N64, which at the time I was playing, it was kind of not really a console anymore. But it was just what my cousins or friends had lying around. And my parents loathed me playing it. Um, but I remember seeing it when I was, you know, because you're a kid, right? And you see these, like these animations and these graphics and there's, there's a controller. You're like, oh my God, that looks so cool. And so I kind of begged my parents at one point to buy me a Game Boy Color. And they bought me one, but they bought me it in France. And they bought me the game in France as well. And this was back when there was no language options. So I had to, I had Pokemon, but it was all in French. I didn't speak a word of French. Um, but I, I, I kind of like just, as like an eight-year-old, I think I just bashed my head at it. And I somehow managed to beat the game, which I guess it isn't that complicated. But the fact that it was all in French, and I had no idea what was happening. But I was like, ah, trial and error, it's fine. I just like seeing what happens. And uh, I remember playing that game <laughs> far too much. Uh, and that was kind of the start for me. I think after that, I was just completely hooked. Uh, on video gaming and i've never really stopped which i don't know what this is about me or what this is about video games <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting that's this is really good to know um okay so tell me so when you get older your parents probably bought you a computer and you played yeah. online i'm assuming yeah at some point i kind of i kind of tricked them into letting me play online games they didn't really know what it was so i was like no just buy me this this wi-fi thing and then i'll, I'll worry about the rest um uh, yeah, I, I they bought me um, a, a Nintendo Wii, and then the Wii had Wi-Fi capabilities, and I managed to figure out, obviously, how to set up all those games and start playing those online. And then that was kind of the end of any chance of me having a normal life, because I think the moment I realized I could be competitive and play against the people, I, every single console or PC after that, I immediately was like, all right, what games can I play? What can I, what can I do now? Um, so I got really hooked into gaming that way, and I... And then afterwards, I kind of fell out of it, but I kind of got back into it as of recent. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I've just kind of, <laughs> any, my parents, bless them, they didn't really understand what any of this stuff was, but I would just kind of ask them very politely, like, okay, my, my birthday's coming up. Could you buy me this Wi-Fi dongle? 
And they're like, oh, this is so bizarre. But yeah, sure. This is all so familiar, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I a 15 year old. Well, no, he just turned 16, but that yeah. came. So this is extremely familiar. Um, so, and so did you play Minecraft? That was a big game. Or um, I, um, I didn't play Minecraft. Minecraft kind um, of was just kind of released around the time when I was kind of into kind of Call of Duty kind of games. Where I'm like, oh, no, I'm Call too of cool Duty. For yeah. This. Okay. I'm too cool for these games now um okay but yeah that that was that was a yeah that kind of came after me but I, I i played it recently but i'm I'm so bad at those types of games I, i'm not creative in that kind of sense i just kind of struggle with with building stuff i'm like I, i'd rather just make a video or something why i don't want to make a house okay um so you got a little bit older and yeah tell me about anime yeah because somewhere along the line you became really interested in anime was that when you were still yeah. in high school or as if my parents weren't concerned enough already i, I gave them the nail in the coffin no i i basically uh, from video gaming like a lot of video games obviously as a lot of people know um you know there's a huge video game scene in japan where they made a lot of their own games and a lot of the most iconic games obviously nintendo come from japan you know and I would kind of play some of these games and I, I would, I really liked the style. I didn't know why. And it turned out it was just, they were all the Japanese games where they were all very animated, lots of really bad acting and really kind of corny. But it, I, the style really kind of stuck with me. And I, I didn't realize it at the time that I was just really into kind of Japanese stuff. And growing up, as you, whenever I saw any kind of Asian media, I always thought, wow, this is so cool as well. And then... Around age 15, 16, I kind of just accidentally stumbled upon anime. Um, I was looking, I was trying to become like a film buff in my mind. So I was, trying, I was going through IMDb's list of like must watch. And there was this like Death Note show, which is a, <laughs> it's rather morbid. It's just about a, a book where you write someone's name, they die. And I, thought, I, oh, I sounds, think I, I know you might have heard show. of it. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm too old for cartoons. I don't watch cartoons anymore because my parents had really instilled in me. They're like, cartoons of a kids, don't watch them. But the premise sounded so cool that I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll watch like one episode. And I just got immediately hooked. And I think it was like from that point onwards, the next like two years, I kind of stopped anything else. And I just only just watched anime. And I, I kind of just fell in love with it. And uh, that kind of started my whole journey into YouTube because I, I became totally infatuated with kind of just being able to talk about this. But in the UK, there's absolutely nobody who's talking about anime at the time. It was very much a kind of thing if you were to talk about it or even bring it up, it's like, oh, what's wrong with you? What is that? Is that like, I don't know what that is. Um, and so I kind of wanted to make friends uh, who who also knew about it. So my genius idea to making friends was, why don't I just make YouTube videos? And uh, if I make YouTube videos, I'm sure I'll make some friends along the way. Uh, and I, was, I guess I was I was kind of accurate. It just didn't pan out the way I thought. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of how I then transitioned anime into becoming kind of a creator. Okay, so I so you made the YouTube videos to find other people online who were interested in anime. Yeah, I was also I I also was a little bit of a sorry, excuse my language, but I was a bit, I was a bit of a little shit. I I wanted to also do like little voice acting things and and do prank calls. So I was kind of like filming that kind of stuff. And <laughs> obviously now I look back, I'm like, oh god, kind of why? But um, you know, at the time I thought it was hilarious. Um, and so I kind of mixed my enjoyment of anime. Uh, and I guess there's this whole other thing going on this whole time while I'm into anime where I, I got into voice acting as well. And that was a whole other thing that started everything. Uh, there's so many, I guess, parallel things happening. Yeah. And that. there's there's a lot of layers. I mean, that was a, another, you know, question yeah. I had. Actually, that's my next question. I mean, mm. how did you start with voice acting? Because that's a really unusual <laughs> field and for a younger person to think oh yeah i can be a voice actor i yeah. mean how did you even decide that you could do that you have a wonderful voice oh, i you. totally could see how you'd be a voice <laughs> actor so but how did you recognize that was there acting in your family did were people on no. in the theater or anything on the stage or no no not at all um my okay. entire family is um uh, <laughs> does engineering and I, I did engineering as well i have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering um but whilst i was kind of getting into anime I, I i don't know why i think this anime does this thing to some people where i think i think it really sucks you into these worlds and i was so kind of infatuated with the idea of being able to portray one of these characters and just kind of kind of live that kind of character's journey 
again, I don't know why. I feel like it's, it's, it sounds like a mental disease when I'm saying it out loud. I'm like, yes, Doctor, I want to be an anime character. <laughs> but but um, I kind of got really into it. And, and, and prior to that, whilst I was growing up, I was always doing these kind of funny voices. And, and I just want to clarify that doing funny voices is absolutely not a, a kind of indicator that you should do voice acting. But it was kind of a fun way of being like, I think I've got a knack for this. Um, and so rather, I, I don't, this sounds like a terrible idea now in hindsight, but growing up, I feel like it made, it made a lot of sense. I had this microphone that I used on Xbox when I used to play on my Xbox. I would talk to people and I found out that you could plug it into your PC. And so I had this really terrible old laptop and it could just about run an audio recording software. And so I started recording myself doing these like uh, characters and I would kind of do these auditions that I would find online. And I, of course, I would never get anything because I had a terrible microphone and I was terrible at it. Um, but I kind of ha kind of got really into it and I thought it was kind of fun. And then I kind of, it was kind of like parallel with playing on these video games. I'd kind of practice doing these voices on these open lobbies, which I'm sure everyone loved what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> um, and I kind of just slowly got a bit better at it. And I, I realized, oh, I think I have a pretty good knack for narration. And so I started doing narration. And the moment I turned 18 and I was kind of in, um, I, I went to university and I'd saved up a tiny bit of money. Um, I, I kind of, I didn't tell my parents or anything. I kind of booked this voiceover class in London, which was about a three hour train ride from where I was actually in university. Uh, and I just went there to go and do this class and do this workshop. Uh, and, and they kind of offered uh, to let me um, come back again and do a more personal session, which I was like, oh, okay, that's, that's cool. Um, and then after I did another session with them, they kind of were offering me kind of like, hey, would you like to come join our roster and do some voice acting? And I was like, thank, thank God I'd done all this silly stuff in my bedroom because that really paid off at that point. And so that kind of led me to doing voiceover more professionally, kind of coinciding with when I roughly kind of started doing YouTube stuff as well. So it was kind of, I was improving at kind of everything at once and I was really, really invested in it. Uh, and my university studies definitely suffered for it. Uh, but it kind of allowed me to really throw myself in creatively. And, and I, I, at the time I was, I'm sure my parents didn't feel this way, but I, I was near certain I could make this work. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this stuff. I know I can, I can, I can do this if I really like, you know, commit myself. And I was also, you know, I think one thing that I was glad from engineering is that I did have a very grounded view of reality. And I was like, okay, I know have the spreadsheet with how much money I'm making and what I can do and realistically how much I can throw into this. And, you know, I'm not going to do anything stupid. I didn't acquire any debt or anything. I just kind of did what was within my means. Uh, and so that was kind of that, that whole kind of crazy journey that I kind of threw on my, threw on you guys there. <laughs> wow. So you're doing these two things simultaneously. You're getting your degree. Did you say chemical engineering? Uh, mechanical engineering. Oh, mechanical engineering. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's I was intense. not. I was not present much. I kind of every weekend I would take a train to London, and it would cost about, you know, maybe like a hundred dollars for a return ticket. And I would just kind of. I had friends out there that I would kind of ask very kindly, "Can I sleep on their couch for the night?" And they would just kind of be like, "Yeah, sure. I don't know what he's doing, but yeah." Um, and so I, I was just, you know, very fortunate that kind of everything coincided, uh, and I still got my degree, which. I think was the big thing my parents that was my next degree. question i did yeah yeah i got i got a pretty good grade too which is shocking i i was terrible the last year i, I did basically didn't do anything it was, was my, the university my... was it in wales or was it in it was in wales then or yeah London? yeah so i i, I grew in... up in wales and i um I speak fluent welsh um i did all my schooling wow. in welsh so um when i went to university there was I got offers from some some better universities around England, but there was a there was a scheme going on with the government where you would get kind of two thirds of your scholarship, uh, two thirds of your university costs covered if you spoke Welsh and went to a university in Wales. So I was like, well, okay, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea to me. Um, yeah, I'm sure your parents uh, thought so too. <laughs> yeah, and I think they were happy that I was still in Wales, even though I was on the opposite end of Wales, which is, um, unfortunately, public transport is not Wales' strong suit. So getting from the other side is actually slower than going from uh, further out. It's, it's a whole mess. UK infrastructure needs a, a, an overhaul, <laughs> for sure. Um, so you started to branch out more into YouTubing. So once you yes. got your degree, did you get a full-time job in what you majored in, or did you just simply just kind of... <sighs> 
launch off and go into YouTubing and yeah. You yeah, know. Basic, basically at the same time, I started my YouTubing uh, and kind of my professional voice acting around my the end of the first year of my university year. Uh, and, and in the UK, a bachelor's is only three years long. Um, and so at the end of this, the second year, I was kind of uh, dabbing my toes in it, kind of trying to do a video every week. Uh, and it started kind of growing and, I, and I, I started getting a little bit of money from it, which I was kind of, which kind of blew my mind. It's the first time you get five dollars from something you created, you're like, "Whoa, this is this is amazing!" What I I, I just uploaded this this thing, and I'm I got ten dollars. This is crazy. I can I can go and buy my meal. And back then, I was like, "Wow, this is that that was life changing." Because at that time, it was it was pretty much my savings that I had from a, a prior job at McDonald's that I had, and uh, a, a loan that I'd taken out, which is pretty common in the UK. You just take out a loan to to live. Um, it's a different loan from your student loans. It's and so I had that. I kind of realized, oh, if I can, if I can, my videos can get more views, and I can make more videos. I think I can, I can pay off this loan and just live off this. Even though it wouldn't be a great living, it would just kind of be enough to survive. And so during the second year, I kind of started ramping it up a little bit. And the third year is where I started to get a lot of more voiceover work. But it was my final year of engineering, so it was kind of tough to balance the two. Uh, but I kind of, <laughs> it's like I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the engineering to the side a little bit and focus more on the YouTube and the voice acting. And my my parents were very understanding. They they were just kind of, listen, as long as you get the degree and you pass, you can do whatever you want for a few years as long as you don't get in trouble um, and don't rack up a bunch of financial debt. So the moment I finished, I, I said to my parents, hey, look, I want to move to London. Uh, I want to go and do voiceover there and I want to do YouTube there. And they were like, oh, sure. <laughs> like, we like London. So, you know, it's and it's not too far from Wales, uh, you know, because... London has amazing train connections, so it's it's like within two hours. So you know, it's not it's not too far. Um, I think in America, that's like oh, a two hour drive. That's easy. That's, that's yeah. Easy. yeah. In the it's UK, true. that's kind of that's kind of crazy. In the UK, like a, a three four hour commute is like whoa, that's that's a lot. Um, but so that I started doing it there, and it was around this time where my 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 YouTube stuff kind of really started to kind of uh, it was. It was taking off, but it was taking off with me only doing these anime character like voices stuff. And I really wanted to change it to kind of focus on me doing kind of more silly stuff, um, kind of about the focus not being the anime characters, more so focus being me and using my voice acting uh, knowledge to kind of make some interesting content. Um, and so the video started doing just terribly. And I was terrified because I just started paying rent and I was kind of living off this stuff. Uh, and it was it was it was going so bad, and I was like, "Oh no, I'm gonna have to ask my parents to to let me move in." But I was really confident. I was like, "I'm I'm I'm certain this is the right direction for my videos." And slowly, after a little bit of time and and kind of changing it very slightly, and it kind of started taking off. Uh, and by the end of the uh, a year of doing it full time, it kind of like tripled what I was originally making. And I was like, "Oh my god, this is great! I can I can kind of comfortably live now." Uh, and so. It was kind of a snowball effect. It was, it, I never really had um, a big kind of blow up like a lot of people get. I never really had this explosive growth. It's been a very, very gradual kind of learning things and implementing new strategies and working with people and hiring more people to work with me. Um, and it's just been a very, very slow uh, climb. Um, and I was living in London for about um, two years. And that was kind of when I got the offer then to move out to Japan. So I still kind of had some anime ties and some of the anime companies wanted to kind of work with me in some kind of promotional sense. Uh, and I got the offer to move to Japan. And mm -hmm. then I took that and then that kind of, that that changed everything. That's when it really blew up for me. Uh, and it kind of, the 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 gradual incline of viewership kind of just, the graph went from like this to kind of like this. And it was like, oh, whoa, okay. Um, the, the kind of content I, I was making drastically changed. And then I started a podcast with my friends which became uh, very popular. Is uh, that the, I, the trash talk one? Yeah, okay, yeah, that, that that was yeah. kind of a, a, a shock to everyone. Uh, I think us and pretty much everyone on YouTube because it just kind of, a podcast had never kind of, um, there, there was, at the time, there was no podcast that were getting that kind of viewership on YouTube because um, it was such a long format. You know, it's two hours long. And the fact that it was getting as many views as full, like normal YouTube videos was kind of unheard of. And so that 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 whole that changed everything, and that kind of sent my whole trajectory in this very strange direction. Uh, and then I started live streaming, and then that's where we are, kind of now, I suppose. 
What year did you did you move to Japan? Twenty twenty one. I moved to Japan in twenty nineteen. Oh, twenty nineteen. Okay. Yeah, okay. I moved okay. right before COVID happened. Okay. And I was kind of kind of stuck here. <laughs> and you're still saying. stuck there. Yeah, <laughs> and you're yeah. not two I, hours away from your parents. They're probably I, like, I, uh, yeah, I'm is he ever coming a twenty hour flight away. <laughs> How uh, did you know? Um, yeah, it was it was a strange strange time being yeah. kind of trapped in a foreign country for two years that you don't speak the language. How did living in Japan during COVID, how did that affect your content creation and your just your the the energy that you put into it? Was it was it was it more draining? Was it you know what what was, was what was the effect it, on you? Yeah, it was um creatively it was kind of hard because I had kind of shifted a lot of my focus to doing covering more Japanese kind of um cultural weird cultural spots kind of trying to cover these places with kind of a new lens of kind of working in these places and kind of showing off what it would be like to to start working in like just these bizarre places like i, I did like a strip club or a butler uh cafe or it's kind of any kind of range of strange job people might find interesting and uh covid yeah it kind of japan really 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 uh was was took covid extremely seriously um, and so everything was closed and, and no one wanted to film anything. And it was, it was very understandable as well, because, it, you know, people also weren't interested in, in f catering to foreign tourists at the time, because there was no foreign tourists. Um, but in terms of the, the YouTube side and, um, I mean, COVID kind of anyone who was already making content before COVID probably saw a massive increase, uh, when COVID happened because, um, people were just watching YouTube a lot more. Um, there was a lot of people who got into watching YouTube and watching live streaming, uh, and kind of, you know, a few months into COVID Japan started to ease up a little bit with filming, you know, they kind of understood that, okay, we, we can film stuff. We just gotta be careful. Um, so it was kind of this really very fortunate circumstance where no one could enter Japan and we kind of had, uh, me and a few other creators kind of had kind of exclusive access to film everything in Japan. And, and a lot of people who were like, oh, I miss Japan. I want to go. I want to go and have a look what's happening. And people kind of had to watch our videos. And so it 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 kind of just, again, it kind of multiplied everything that was already happening. Um, and it made this kind of, I mean, it, it was kind of, it, uh, for content creators, COVID was kind of fantastic. But for everyone else, it was miserable. I mean, for it was, it, it really did kind of increase everybody's numbers across the board, which was kind of weird to say and it feels very odd to benefit of kind of a global pandemic but it did it really allowed us to to sink into it more and i i didn't really find myself getting burnt out it was kind of more i was more able to dedicate myself to it in a weird way um <clears throat> and you you talk about streaming like like hmm. a little older tell me what you're streaming now i mean tell me <laughs> for for our you know, listeners that aren't hmm. too familiar with streaming. Um, so, tell me a little bit about streaming. Yeah, streaming is um, was was traditionally only really uh, people playing video games, and now you're probably thinking that sounds so boring. Anybody, anybody who's not into video games, um, but you know, a lot of people just kind of want to put something on and, and want to watch something, and a lot of people kind of engage with seeing somebody they really like play a game they really like. Uh, and for a long time, that was kind of all that that streaming was. And it was only very recently where people had kind of come into it with this rejuvenated kind of view on it. Uh, and nowadays, people are doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, I myself do a lot of uh, in out outdoor streaming. So I'll have a backpack with a bunch of internet modems and a bunch of batteries, and I'll, I'll stream a camera that uh, is pretty good quality, and, and we'll go and do some fun stuff. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's good and bad ways to do it. Uh, I recently did one where I uh, we hired an RV, and we hired out a bunch of places to 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 go and uh, stream live where we would we'd break tiles and we would go and sand surf and uh, what else did we do? We played airsoft all live on stream. Um, and you know that that stuff's a lot more kind of for me is a lot more interesting. Uh, but there's also some other stuff like uh, I guess I do some streams where people can uh, send me uh, little clips and if they make me laugh uh, i'll i'll give them a, a little bit of money and kind of like a challenge like if you can make me laugh I'll, I'll give you money but the thing is i'm british and i don't laugh um i'm miserable 
Um, I also do, let me actually pull my stuff up because I've, I've done so much stuff. Uh, recently, sometimes I'll be like, hey, send me a picture. I'll make a, a, a an, an internet form where people can send me their bedrooms, like pictures, and I'll rate them. I'll be like, this is a terrible room. You need to clean this up. Or this is, now. this is good. This all, you know, some people have like really intense obsessions. They'll have a ton of anime figures. And I'll be like, okay, all right, let's, let's go through these. Um, other things that I started doing recently, I just opened up like presentations where people can can make a presentation about anything and present it to me. And we'll just go through them and people can watch online. I also recently did a, a game jam where I challenged people to make video games in three days and the, the top five, I would give $1,000 each to. Uh, just really doing some really like creative stuff and getting people involved and kind of trying to change um, streaming from being just about video games to kind of being about a, a, a live medium where we can kind of make some fun ideas and test out some really cool concepts and see what works and see what really engages people. Um, and so I'm always trying some, always trying very strange ideas uh, and seeing what works. And obviously, as the IDF knows, I uh, also did uh, a bunch of cycling live, which sounds incredibly boring. Um, at least I thought it was um, until I kind of, I, 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 I work with a lot of programmers. Um, I, I hire two programmers full time. The whole job is just to, I'm, I'm like, think of weird stuff that we can use to make live formats more engaging. Um, I have a, I have a Nerf gun that can shoot me, um, depending on what chat controls people watching. My lights can be controlled by my viewers. Um, just a bunch of really bizarre things that we're like, can we make this? Yeah, let's try and make it. And so, uh, for example, with the cycling, I thought, how do you, how do you make something like cycling engaging for people? Because it's such a, you know, if I'm just cycling for eight hours a day, there's nothing really to engage people there. And we, we kind of workshop this idea of okay well, let's make like a kind of a, a video game like heads up display like a bunch of information on the screen that kind of conveys to you what's happening and you could jump in at any time and you can understand so we we came up with this idea of having a a, a live tracker that would show you exactly where i am and where i'd been with a blue line and it would tell you the progress of that day and would tell you how fast i'm going how many more kilometers we have uh and then we also programmed a, a Fitbit to work so it would show you the live heart rate and how many calories I'd burned. So it's really like a video game. You're kind of just watching me just cycle and you're getting in in real time stats being conveyed live to a broadcast. Uh, and so that was how we figured out, okay, this is how you make a really engaging storyline here. And then we we also added on the charity element where we're doing this for charity and, and kind of, you know, you can kind of get take these really mundane concepts of doing something really boring suddenly you can start introducing these kind of ideas or programs that really allow you to flash out an idea and make it so much more um, and, and allow it to kind of make it an entertaining concept. I'm so sorry for ranting. I will let you. No, it's, it's really fascinating, Connor, really for me. I'm, I'm just trying to, it, you really can't even categorize it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's not really bizarre. reality television because that's all scripted yeah. anyway. Yeah. And this, it, this really is just sort of like, interactive television it sounds to me Almost, yeah, you know yeah. because your viewers can communicate with you and yeah. even control some of your environment it sounds like yeah you yeah. know when you're when you're streaming it's it's really mm. fascinating yeah um how dare you tell different. us about the interesting things sorry so after I, we've invited you I, onto our podcast i, I, I <laughs> rant a lot i'm sorry i i get i get carried away it's almost time for the 2023 primary immunodeficiency conference whether you are recently diagnosed, interested in more in-depth medical topics related to your diagnosis, or want to learn more about the rarest diagnoses, this conference is for you. Our keynote speakers will share their journeys with primary immunodeficiency, and world-class immunologists will share the latest research on topics related to PI. Plus, you'll have a chance to network with exhibitors and other members of the PI community. Visit primaryimmune.org conference to register. Okay, so how did, because your efforts to raise funds for IDF, which we are mm. greatly appreciative for, <laughs> um, really occurred because you met Iron Mouse. I don't know yeah. her real name. I would just call her Iron Mouse. Um, and she's your friend. And, yeah. you know, you learned, tell me a little bit about how you met her. Was it 
I guess it was just virtually or have you ever yeah. met her in real life? I, I, no, I've, tell I've, me I've about your friendship. Life. Yeah. Tell well, me about I, that. I, I met Iron Mouse. Um, oh my God. Went back maybe like 2021 or 2020. I'm not exactly sure on the date. And, um, but I, I just seen her stuff around cause she was, she was kind of quite prominent. Uh, I thought that she was very interesting. So I was like, Oh, we should, we should, uh, we should do a stream sometime together. Uh, and so we played some games and it was very fun. And, uh, I, I got to speak to her a little bit more outside of the streaming. And I just thought that she was a really like interesting and, and unique person. And then she told me more about uh, her disease. Cause at the time I was like, Oh, you should like Japan's awesome. You should go and check it out. And then, you know, obviously I found out she can't, she can't come and check it out, unfortunately, you know, and to me, I, I'd never heard of CVID at that time. You know, I, I, I'm from, I'm sure it's the same in the US as well, but I'm, I'm from, again, from Wales in the very countryside, everyone's very outdoorsy. And they were like, what? No, you, the illness is, uh, it doesn't exist. You just have to be more active and eat healthy. And it's, uh, that's very much the kind of mindset that I grew up in. Um, and so I'd never heard of this at all. And, and, and obviously you're talking to mouse, I'd kind of learn more about it. And, um, uh, and as a, as a creator who'd been doing this for a very long time, uh, you know, at the time I knew mouse, I'd, I'd been working online like full time like six, seven years and, and mouse had just kind of started. Uh, and at the time I really felt like, oh, I could, you know, I'd, I'd love to kind of, you know, kind of impose myself. Like if you need any help with anything, you want any advice, I've been doing this for a very long time. I can, I can give some any knowledge or any insight on any topics. And so we kind of just spoke a lot about it. And um, I, I, we just kind of started collaborating a lot more on stream and it kind of became a weekly thing. And um, she's helped me out a lot with my streaming stuff and it's been a great assistance and I've helped her out a lot. And it just kind of became a very good team where it's always nice to have somebody who you can just kind of rely on, who's very, who's just always reliable and always delivers. Uh, and so having that kind of that we were great friends, but also we work really well together professionally. Um, we just kind of became very close. And then, you know, the moment that any kind of charity event came up, I was like, well, I really want to help this organization that, that a lot of people didn't know about and a lot of people didn't even know about the disease so i was like okay this seems like a good cause because i you know not not to slight any <laughs> charities or really really rude but i often find that a lot of people when they do things with charity there's it's, also, it's very generic and they're like i just heard of this charity it sounds like a good idea let's just do it but i really wanted to to be engaged with the, with the charity and the message and the story uh, to get people involved as well i find that having a, a story really gets people involved in the charity. And so it kind of really just made sense and the stars kind of aligned. What was your first exposure to really the uh, potential, the, the mind boggling, like philanthropic efforts that streamers and content creators are capable of? What was the first thing that made you say, wow, that's something, that's something that I can do with this? Yeah, I'd always seen other creators like um, Yogg's Cast would do a big charity event every year and um, Jacksepticeye would always do a Thanksmas who'd raise, you know, $20 million, crazy numbers. Uh, and obviously I'm, I'm, I can't, I can't raise those amounts, but I figured I could, I could try and raise a good amount and I have this large platform and, um, you know, I feel like I'm in a very fortunate position where I've been able to, to live very comfortably off what I do. Uh, and it just felt that even if, I wouldn't raise a crazy amount. I feel like I, as a, as a somebody in such a privileged position, I should at least use my platform um, occasionally to, to raise money for these kind of events um, and these kind of causes. And so that felt, just felt very natural to do. How have the efforts of like content creation and then creating these gigantic charity hmm. events, uh, how have those intersected at all? Have you learned one, like, have you learned things from one that you never thought you would have learned from the other? Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes you, you, you gain a lot more than you realize, um, from, from doing a, a philanthropic event, uh, kind of, kind of, uh, I feel like as a, as a, as a content creator and as a person, you grow so much more being able to do these kind of events and being able to give back, um, as opposed to always, you know, doing events that are all about yourself. Um, I, I, I found that it was just very rewarding, um, just uh, mentally. Um, and I, and being able to help people and, and being able to give people a reason to, to get involved in something, I found that really impactful, uh, and more beneficial to me, um, than in any other kind of event where I would, I would personally benefit. Um, and I, I just, I, I re it really, really engaged with me. 
So Connor, I want to make sure that I have all of the fundraising that you've done for IDF mm. um, correct. Mm. Um, I did a lot of research, so I just want to make sure that <laughs> yeah. I was a reporter in my other life. So that's fair enough. Why. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. So you had a cyclothon one yeah. for IDF, right? That yeah. was in 2022, August yeah. and September. Yeah. And I think you raised 350,000. I think, I think it was 320,000, but yeah, it was around that. Okay. And then cyclothon two. Mm -hmm. That was just recently. That was in March. Yep. Yep. Two months ago. Well, my yeah, God, crazy you raised thing. over a half million dollars, which is, yeah, yeah. that's just, yeah, it I, blows my mind, honestly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, and, and I, yeah, I see that she was live streaming on Twitch for eight hours a day for nine days straight. Is that right? Yeah. I was cycling pretty much uh, uh, like a full-time job cycling for like a week and a half. Mm -hmm. Um through through rain and uh and other horrible conditions mm -hmm. um but it was very fun it, i you know i won't lie I, I do enjoy it and i i love being i love being physical i love doing physical activities and i i really like conveying those people as well to to if possible please please exercise don't play video games all day right well that's the thing is it gives you an opportunity to actually get out of yeah, you know, exactly the exactly a little bit <laughs> and like enjoy the outdoors which your parents would be happy about that so. oh they they love it yeah they love those <laughs> those dreams <laughs> And um, and then then on uh, in May 2023, did you do it an auction? I did. Oh, yeah, right? I didn't. I did an auction in um, uh, 2022. I think May. It might have been. Oh, was it um, May 2022? Okay, because I was like, yeah. that doesn't seem right to me because it yeah. seemed like that would just been like last month or something. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure I had that right. And I have like over fifty five thousand hmm. dollars you raised. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was a quick little. I think four or five hour stream where I just sold stuff off and people people got really engaged with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I watched I watched bits and pieces of it. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I did. <laughs> it was a very small room. That's yeah. That's this room. Yeah. I I, <laughs> I just one day I was like, right, we're going to auction off this stuff. I don't want any more. People buy it, please. <laughs> and they did. And they did. I did. I think people got really engaged. <laughs> um. Okay. So. Let's talk about the actual auction a little bit. You know, there's a lot of information on the website already. Um, tell me what role you'll play in the auction. Are you going to be the auctioneer the for four hours? Yep. Or are you going to have some of your guest streamers step in and, you know, basically that, kind of be the main auctioneer, main host, kind of the one who's keeping the flow of the show, calling when the item auctions are done. Uh, introducing all the guests so the guests will come on and introduce the items maybe banter a little bit uh you know and they'll watch their items go up and they'll try and hide people up um but yeah mainly my role is the auctioneer the host uh kind of making sure this whole thing goes well and is entertaining hopefully fingers crossed tell me some of just a few of the items that you're going to be contributing that you think people might be super interested Ooh, in we have a we have a handmade painting from uh, PewDiePie, who's one of the biggest YouTubers ever, over a hundred million subscribers, and he made a his first ever handmade painting. That we're gonna auction off, which I think people are gonna be very excited for. Um, and we also, uh, what else are we giving away? I'm giving away a bunch of my own anime stuff. Uh, I'm also gonna give people the opportunity to be in one of my videos as well. Um, a friend of mine is giving Iron Mouse is giving a chance to hang out with her for an hour. Um, another put. A chess streamer is a very, very strong chess player is giving away a, a chess lesson. Um, we have a, a legal YouTuber who's giving away a gavel. Um, there's just a bunch of varied items. Some people are giving away a t-shirt, just a white t-shirt. We have somebody giving away a copy of FIFA 17. Just various random items. It's completely random. We have some really crazy valuable things and some really dumb items. But, it, you know, it should make for a really fun show that people uh, some items will do really well some will do really funny <laughs> maybe not so well we'll see what platform <laughs> what platform is the fifa 17 um... it's like an xbox 360 i think <laughs> it's like it's not even remotely useful i don't know what he's giving i don't know why he's giving away but it'll be it'll be funny so that comes with like a fire hazard as well i guess so yeah yeah, yeah. You, the, you get a red, red ring of death xbox as well i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and I have the list of the people who will be attending the other stream. I don't really, 
It's the on the website. Yeah, you know who okay. they are. You don't but have to know them. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't know. I did a thing. It's my favorite name. That's that's pretty interesting. It's really um, fantastic. <laughs> and so they'll be there. And what about now? Will Iron Mouse be there in some virtual form? Iron Mouse will be there virtually uh, on an iPad. Um, okay. We'll be able to interact a little bit. So it should be pretty fun. Um, but we'll have some messages from Iron Mouse as well and videos. So very excited okay. for that. Okay. And do you have any kind of goal or is it just uh, as far as, you know, the amount you want to raise or is it just I'd, however we much we raise, we raise? I'd love, I'd love to, and I, I know it's just so ambitious, but I'd love to raise half a million again, um, just so that I can, I can say this year I've raised a million dollars for charity and, and the IDF, of course. Um, <laughs> it's my, it's been my goal this year to raise a million dollars for charity in general. Um, so if I can get it done in June, I, that, I'd be very happy with that. Um <laughs> So that that's my goal. So okay. if we can do that, that'd be that'd be great. Okay. Um, what would you say to people to encourage them to participate in the auction? Yeah, I mean, just watching along and not even getting involved at all helps a lot. Just being a viewer and just getting excited about the items. Um, there's so many cool individuals and items that are coming on, and I think. Again, people people always like. Oh, I wish I could donate. It's like, no, 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 don't worry about that. Just just being a part of the event and watching helps kind of spread the event around and gets more people involved. And maybe some people who are more financially able to to give a lot of money or give anything. Um, so just just watching and being there helps so much. Exactly, and also, I mean, it helps spread awareness of what you know primary immunodeficiency is. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, it's certainly nothing. I had ever heard of four years ago when I started working for IDF. Hmm. Um, and I've learned a heck of a lot. Um, so yeah, so people will learn, you know, more about this um condition, which is rare, hmm. but maybe not as rare as some people think. Yeah. Um I don't think I have any other questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that I haven't asked you about? Uh nothing off the top of my head. Um, I just thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Connor. Thank you for for your time. Oh no, 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 thank you. <laughs> I have a, uh, I have two more questions. If that's okay. Sure. Yeah, of course. Um, I just wanted to ask. So, streamers are super notorious for you know the grind. Uh, sometimes yeah. a little bit too much to a fault. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it seems like you found a really healthy work life balance, and particularly yeah. for our community people with pi they they have to find that they have to figure out how mm. many spoons they have available mm. for any given day so you know like i said it seems like you found a, a really healthy work-life balance how do you how do you manage that yeah i think it's always very important to at least you know give yourself at least maybe one day or you just just kind of give something to yourself <laughs> you know take it easy you know go for a walk be active or whatever you can do uh you know whatever you can do within your means um to kind of just change your outlook on whatever it is you're doing it's very easy to get lost in your work or even a hobby and it's just very important i think to just stop what you're doing every now and then and just get a different perspective um i also make sure that's always something i'm looking forward to um there always needs to be something that you're like you feel you're working towards you know if you're working hard on something else you're like well at least i have that hangout with a friend or i'm going to be playing games later in the day even when I was studying, it was always like I would do, I would study in the morning and then I would look forward to playing video games in the evening. And that was always kind of how I managed to do it. It's just always about having something to get excited about, making sure you give yourself a break um, and and managing your time appropriately. You know, I think that it's very easy sometimes to, to procrastinate for an hour here and there. But I try to make sure that when I'm working, it's, it's good work. Uh, and then when I'm not working, I, I can really enjoy it. Uh, and I find that if I focus on making sure when I am working that it, it's quality work, that I can get a lot more done in less time because I'm I, I'm I'm more willing to because I know there's something to look forward to, and so I'm always trying to balance that. Um, but occasionally I do weeks where I do crazy amounts of work and weeks where I don't do so much. It really does depend. I'm very fortunate that I can pick my schedule. Yeah, there's some weeks where you bicycle a thousand kilometers. Yeah, I mean to me that's fun though. I like that. That's like I I get to get outside. I get to do something cool. I get to be a part of something, and I I I love I love exercise. I'm I will find any excuse to make exercise work um i absolutely love it is that how you is that how you turn it off like at, at the end of yep. the day or when you finish that's that's how you cut it off yep i love rock climbing i love running i love cycling um 
pretty much anything that gets my heart rate high i'm 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 excited about i i just it, it really helps me decompress and helps me kind of be like okay all right okay i can reset a little bit i can i i feel like my body is healthy which is a big thing trying my best to remain healthy when possible um i have good health i feel like i should i should utilize that um i'm very fortunate in that sense well connor thank you so much those are all the questions thank that you I thank have. you mm -hmm. thank you thank you for listening to the idf podcast this podcast is a service of the immune deficiency foundation if you like our show and want to learn more please subscribe to this podcast so future episodes will be sent to your device automatically and leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify so that others may discover this podcast as well. To learn more about primary immunodeficiency and the PI community, please visit the IDF website at primaryimmune.org. For more information on how to get engaged in advocacy on behalf of the PI community, check out IDF's Patient Advocacy Engagement Toolkit at primaryimmune.org slash patient toolkit. And if you have a question you'd like to have answered, email us at idf at primaryimmune.org. Thanks for tuning in.